Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. So today we're going to be having a quick look into how to document your code. If you enjoy this kind of content, please consider subscribing and let's get right into it. So as you gain more experience in the, you know, the tech industry or as a software engineer, you'll start to realize that you spend a lot more time uh, actually reading code as opposed to writing code. And this could be, you know, reading your own code from, from the past or reading someone else's code in your team and reviewing it, or even, you know, reading code from third party tools and, you know, examples on, you know, someone else's documentation, etc. So essentially what you'll come to realize is making sure that your code is, is readable and maintainable is a lot more important than, you know, other aspects uh, in engineering. So one of the ways, of course, to do this is to make sure all your code is well documented. And, you know, there are a few tips and tricks that can help you um, keep your code well documented and readable. So what we're going to do today is we're going to have a look at five different ways to document your code. And I will leave timestamps in the description below if you want to skip to, you know, to any of those different ways. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get right into it. So the first way I have here is to use the tool that your language provides. So this is otherwise known as self-documented code. So basically using the, the tools of the language or, you know, the framework to try to express uh, in a clear manner what the code is actually doing itself. So things like um, having meaningful directory structures or modules or packages and um, good naming naming scheme for you know variables and methods, etc. So all of these things will contribute to a more readable uh, code base. And um, another aspect of that is also using kind of common coding conventions, common patterns, best practices, etc. So the main reason we follow these practices is that um, it gives a certain familiarity for anyone else reading the code base. Not necessarily that it's the most performant or the you know the best way to do it. It's just people are more familiar with practices, uh, you know, common approaches so that when they read your code, they'll kind of recognize that and can easily kind of go through your code, um, you know, without having to read every single line. And the main goal generally when it comes to self-documented code is that someone that's, you know, new to the code base can skim over the code at a glance in a few seconds and be able to tell you exactly what's going on, right? So that's kind of a way to, to test if your code truly is um, self-documenting. If someone is going through your code and they're, you know, every single you know, every few lines they're kind of, you know, squinting and trying to figure out exactly what's doing, then that's probably a bad sign. What you really want is you want to take your code and extract, you know, certain parts out so that, you know, things are hidden behind names, essentially, which is the documentation hidden behind function names, class names, uh, etc. So let's have kind of a quick look at a couple of examples. Um, I mentioned their meaningful variable name. So of course, a bad example is this one here. And that, that means nothing to, to anyone. Someone that's skimming the code isn't going to be able to read or understand what that is. Um, especially when it's used, we can use something a bit more, um, a bit more expressive, like a uh, username. Kind of another, you know, example when it comes to logic is uh, this if, if statement here. So there's a couple of things that we can improve uh, with this. So here we can kind of see the, you know, the logic we can, you know, if you code, you can understand exactly what the logic's doing. You know, it's looking for a flag um, three and it's looking for an, an age that's, you know, greater than or equal to 65, but we've no idea why or, you know, what they mean. So you know, if somebody that's new is looking at this, they wouldn't be able to explain to, you know, for example, someone non-technical what's going on here. So a better approach to this um, is to kind of abstract those away to constants. And when you see numbers kind of out in the wild like this, it's commonly referred to as uh, magic numbers because, you know, you don't know what they do. You don't know what the, you know, where they came from or why, why they are what they are. So when you have constants here, you're basically documenting this number. Um, so you're saying this number is an hourly flag. This number here is the minimum age for full benefits. Uh, and now this if statement is a lot easier to read um, because you understand the context and um, even better yet, you know, kind of the, the final uh, change that we can make to, to make this much easier to read is just abstract that all out to a function um, because the, the details here are not really important um, if somebody's skimming over the code. So pop out to a function. That's the documentation for the for the function name is eligible for full benefits. Somebody could just read that and, and move on without having to to kind of understand uh, the logic in there. So next up is comments. Now, comments are probably the most misused form of, you know, documenting your code. They can be very, very useful on one hand, and on the other hand, they can be very, very harmful and cause confusion. So um, there's a quote here by Robert Martin, and he's the he's the founder of uh, the, the kind of Agile Manifesto, and he wrote a book called Clean Code. And you can see here that basically says that nothing can be quite um, so helpful as a well placed comment. And on the other side, there's nothing can be quite so damaging uh, as an old crafty comment. So this quote, I think quite accurately represents, um, you know, how comments are, are, are usually used. So it's definitely something that we need to be very careful with. So generally comments should only be used um, to explain something that the code can't. So basically, if you ever have a piece of code and you, you know, you add a comment, what you really want to try to do is you, you want to try to use all the techniques from self-documented codes. So that's, you know, removing magic numbers, extracting out to, to functions and variables, etc. 
to make sure that the code um, makes sense. And if you get to the point where you can no longer refactor the code to explain something, for example, context, um, i.e. the why, then that's where you can add a, a comment. So again, the comments are usually for answering the why. Why is the code doing what it's doing as opposed to the what? Um, so let's have a quick look at an example here, which should hopefully uh, provide a bit better context. So the one that you kind of commonly see is uh, a comment here that is basically just you know reiterating what the code is doing. So this, this comment here is just basically restating the if statement. So this is not providing any kind of useful information, right? So what we're going to do is instead of just removing the comment completely, we're going to turn the comment into a, a good comment. So one that provides actual context, etc. Then we're going to refactor the code and see how we can actually uh, essentially remove the need for the, the comment or keep it in if, if we think that it's still valuable. So uh, a better approach to this is we can update that comment and provide a bit of context. So, you know, port numbers below 1024 are well-known ports and that's why we're using it in this if statement. So that's, you know, that's great. Um, but again, we can still improve on this. And um, what we can do there is we can hide this behind a, a function, right? So if we put this behind a function, then um, the function name has root privileges, gives whoever's skimming the code enough context not to even, in theory, go down into the function and read more. Um, but you know, if they do want to, there is this comment that's hidden away, so it doesn't clutter the code base. It's hidden away in the function, and it gives us a bit more context as to you know why the, this check again uh, is using the number one hundred two four. And again, if you remember from the last um, the last slide, we can you know abstract that way into a um, into a, a constant here. So that is now no longer a magic number. And the, the constant name here gives you a bit of context as to what that number is. So it's the highest privileged port. And you know, here in this case, it's arguable that you know you could take the comment out completely because I think the combination of the function name as well as you know the, the constant name here can provide enough context. But you know, sometimes there are certain phrases, um, you know, such as well-known ports, et cetera, that um, are usually a good reference point for a user to, to Google, et cetera, if there's context or something about the domain that isn't quite clear, even with the names, you can leave that in. It's just one line. It's not, you know, it's not too bad. If you are comfortable or confident that, you know, the users uh, or the developers are going to be able to understand this without the comment, you can remove it. So next up, we have tests. Now, most people are aware that tests, of course, you know, are there to, to kind of catch bugs or prevent errors. But another great aspect of tests is to uh, basically give you an idea of how the code should behave um, not just that the code does what it does. And um, this is basically done through the use of, you know, the, the, the test function names, et cetera, which we'll get into a few uh, examples just after this. Uh, another aspect of tests is they are essentially just examples of how to use, you know, APIs, functions, methods, or whatever it is, uh, basically your code with assertions. So if you think about any time you're investigating a new tool or, you know, bringing in a new framework, one of the first things you might do is look for a, an example of what the code looks like, right? And that is basically just a test. And a test is just an example of how to use a, a certain function or a certain um, service. And it's got the added benefit of having an assertions there to actually enforce that behavior. And another point here is tests also give you an example of edge case scenarios, which isn't always the easiest thing to uh, express within a function. So it gives you edge cases, it gives you basically examples of inputs and outputs, etc. So that's basically another great way to document your code. So let's have a look at a quick example at very high level. So if we had, for example, a requirement to implement a, a stack, um, we might have a couple of tests. And this is, I would say, kind of a, a bad way to, to add tests, but this is something that I, I see quite commonly. So we have a stack with a couple of methods, you know, push and pop, which is just a, a common stack. And I'm not going to add the implementation here because I think the function name of a test should give you enough context of how things should behave. Um, here, we're not getting any context at all. We're just, we're basically being told that the code has a push and a pop method. Um, the code does that already, we, you know, we have that, so we don't need to, to replicate that in the tests. What we really want from our tests is a bit more context uh, about the behavior. So when we push or when we pop, what, you know, what is the behavior going on there? So um, a better example are, you know, is are something like this. So um, should retrieve values in the order they're added? Um, this provides the same you know, the same assertions, the same test, but it kind of gives you a bit more of an example of uh, the behavior of what happens when you use these functions. And then we have a couple of edge case scenarios. So, you know, what happens if, you know, the stack is empty, what happens if the, you know, the threshold is reached, etc. So this gives you, like I said, a bit more context um, about the functions and it better describes the behavior of what's going on. So now if we were going to refactor or, you know, add uh, features onto this, you know, the stack, um, it's a lot 
kind of easier to, to reason about the, the functionality based off of these function names as opposed to these ones up here. Next up is the git commit log. So this is probably one of the most um, misunderstood forms of documentation and that's understandably so. Uh, it's really hard to write good you know commit messages. It's really hard to get into that frame of mind. Um, so I'll just give, kind of give a high level overview of, of what it is and how it helps and then I'll, I'll give you a link to a, a kind of a really good resource to, to learn a bit more about that. So um, I'll just kind of go through these points here but basically um, your commit messages are going to give you more context about the changes that are happening. So most of the time, like I said, in the kind of the comments slide, you want to refactor the code up to a certain point um, to try to get rid of the, the comments. And then you might want to add the comment to add additional context. Well, sometimes the context isn't just one line. The context is something you have to you know explain, um, give a bit of background or even link to kind of various places. Um, and, you know, the question is, where, where do you put all that you know context? Where do you put all that research? Let's say you have to do something completely out of the normal way because of you know specific scenarios, specific bugs, specific tooling. Um, there's no real way to express that in the code uh, without you know cluttering everything. So a git commit message is basically the perfect opportunity to do that. So I said here that if you've ever been in a situation, which I believe most developers have, um, asking yourself, you know, why is this done that way? What is this you know crazy logic going on? Why didn't we just do this thing? Um, if you're ever asking that question uh, and you haven't you know, been able to find the answer, then that's a missed opportunity for a good commit message. Um, and again, that's the reason it's so hard. It's hard to do a commit message because while you're writing code, you don't know what other people might not know um, in terms of context or in terms of what you're doing. So it's a difficult one, but it's something that you can kind of practice over time uh, and get better at. The kind of top tips for this is if you ever are writing code and you think, hey, you know, that's something weird I'm doing, or you've had to research something, take an answer from Stack Overflow, or go a slightly different approach, basically take them down as notes. Uh, and then when you write your commit message, just just list them out there. There's no harm in having more information in your commit messages than less. I'll leave this um, this link in, in the slides here and in the description below if you wanna kind of follow on and, and read more a bit about that. And last but not least are kind of readmes and wikis. Now, uh, I always recommend that any kind of uh, documentation that is not directly related to code, such as architecture, infrastructure, um, the structure of the, the, the code base, the platform, the different services, how they communicate, coding standards, pre best practices, etc. Um, all of these things, um, which are not directly related to the code, but are definitely a big part of you know the code base, um, and the team, and you know for the for the development lifecycle, should all be in you know either readmes or wikis, and they should live um, alongside the code. So usually for me, I always have a, um, a docs directory in the the root of my you know projects, uh, and that's where things like this will will live um, under Markdown files. So. Um, these basically provide, like I said, higher higher context, higher level context. Um, this is all about if somebody new is looking at your code base, how quickly can we get them to understand where things are and you know understand the, the flow of things. So as well as making sure your actual individual lines of code and the functions are well documented, you really also need to provide the bigger picture um, of how how things um, how things work together. Any questions that get asked repeatedly or any questions that you find yourself asking when you're you know, onboarding someone or going through the code base or searching for something to be documented and added to you know, something like a, a readme or a wiki. So I think that's everything I wanted to cover in this video. Um, all these different approaches to documentation is something that you can incorporate in your day-to-day. -day. So if it's not something that you're doing today, you can kind of incrementally you know, add, add these different approaches um, and then it just becomes, you know, second nature. Just as you're picking up tasks, you'll be able to do these uh, kind of side by side with them. And I think it's just one of those things that you'll, you know, you'll never regret, you know, documenting your code, but you will uh, almost certainly regret not doing the other way. So uh, if it's something that you can incorporate, yeah, I definitely recommend doing so. So thank you very much for watching. Have a good day and I'll see you in the next one.